So welcome everyone. Today's speaker is Ben Green, a professor in Cambridge, but soon to become a professor in Oxford. He will be talking to us about bounded gaps between primes. Okay, thanks very much for inviting me to speak here. So I'd like to talk today. Uh, yeah, I want to talk today about a very recent breakthrough in prime number theory. And um, there's a sense in which it's quite an inappropriate talk for this conference because it was done not by a young mathematician but by a relatively old mathematician well into his 50s who'd actually basically never done anything before. Uh, so it's a very unusual sort of development. Um, wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a career path, but uh, it should give everybody hope. Anyway, so this is on uh, Zhang's work. James Dillon on finding gaps between primes. So I can state the theorem very easily. The theorem is that there's an absolute constant H. Um, with the property that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by the most H. So P prime minus P is less than H, but infinitely many distinct primes And, uh, well, in Zhang's paper, he gets H is about 70 million. What's that for 70 million? But there's a kind of ongoing collaborative project hosted on Terry Tao's website, which has got this down. And it's, I think, more or less just removed the last three zeros. No, no, it's about 70,000. And, um, I don't think it's going to go too much further than that. I would guess probably 10,000 10, is a limit. So what's the point of this theorem? Well, there's a very famous conjecture called the twin prime conjecture. And that states that probably H is 2. <coughs> So in other words, there should be infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most two. So why is this impressive? Well, the previous best known bound, well, there was no previous best known bound. <laughs> so it's a decent result, that's for sure, but it's not, uh, it's probably not a lot small result. So for those of you who've never thought about prime numbers very much before, let me put this in context by just reminding you a few things about them, telling you a few things about them. So a very basic fact about the prime numbers, which is not at all obvious, um, was only proved about 100 years ago, is the prime number theorem. So the prime number theorem is telling you how many primes there are. And um, that's a quantity that's denoted by pi of x. So pi of x is the number of primes less than or equal to x. And the theorem is that it's asymptotically x over log x. And what that means is that whilst there are quite a lot of primes less than x, if x is big, the density of them tends to zero. So just by knowing how many primes there are, you certainly can't get bounded gaps. So on average, um, the gaps between primes tend to infinity. 
Um, but for those of you who studied a bit of probability, you might want to convince yourself that if you take a random set amongst a set of integers between 1 and x of density 1 over log x, then almost surely, with very high probability, it will have bounded gaps. In fact, it will have gaps of size 1. So in that sense, uh, the Jang theorem is not at all surprising. Um, and incidentally, the fact that there are not, obviously there can't be too many gaps between primes of size 1. So that tells you that the primes are not quite random. But everyone thinks that they are random once you take account of the fact that they, they're basically all odd or none of them are divisible by 3 and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that there's a heuristic, in fact there are lots of heuristics in prime number theory, that, lead, that um, make everyone pretty much certain that this twin prime conjecture is true. So as with many results in prime number theory, it's somehow not the result of the surprise, but the fact that you can actually prove it. some things about the proof of this. And um, the first thing to say is that this is not an isolated breakthrough. This is somehow the combination of many strands of analytic number theory from the past 100 years or so. so there, there are somehow two main things that come together. There's work of Goldston, Pince, and Yogaro. Um, which itself builds on work of Selbert. So I'll mention a bit about that in a moment. And then there's a, another whole body of work which is associated with names like Vinogradov <coughs> and Linux, <coughs> Bombieri, um, Ibanez, Friedlander, Brown, and Fuji. So in other words, almost a who's who of 20th century analytic number theory. So I'll say what these two bodies of work are, and more or less what Zhang has done is bring them together. And actually that in itself was not a completely new idea, as I'll say in a moment, but um, the way in which he made it work is, is definitely novel. So what are these two bubbles that I've drawn here? Uh, well, the first one is, this is much more recent than this. So this was basically done around 2005, although Selberg was operating in the 1940s. And what these guys did was to find a very surprising link between how primes are distributed distribution of primes in, um, in arithmetic progressions and, um, and gaps and bounded gaps. So I think that was quite surprising. Somehow, I think there's an analogy for people who know about the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Um, nobody really had that much of a clue how to go about Fermat's last theorem until, surprisingly, it was linked with some famous conjectures about elliptic curve. And somehow this plays the role of that here. It's pretty surprising that, that there should be anything, any connection between these two things. But once the connection was made, there was a whole theory waiting to be applied to it, and that's this theory. So, all of these people have worked on at various stages finding information about how primes behave. In arithmetic progression. Um, but obviously before Jean came along these two things didn't quite uh, match up. So what he did was, was basically tweak both of these sides in non-trivial ways to make them match up. So everything is about how primes are distributed 
in arithmetic progressions. And um, so let me talk a little bit about that. So the question is, how many primes are there less than x which lie in some arithmetic progression of the form congruent to c mod d? So how many primes p less than x are congruent to c mod d? Um, So actually, it's, when you're talking about primes, it's best, if you want to avoid writing too many logs, it's best to introduce a weighting function that kind of gets rid of the logs. So let me do that. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the von Mongol function. Lambda. So lambda n is basically log n. And zero otherwise. Actually, that's not quite correct. Um, it's also it's also log p if it's n is a power of p. Uh, but let me just ignore that. So what I've introduced is it's basically taking the primes and multiplying them through by log n. Well, once you've done this, you can state the prime number theorem in a much more <coughs> pleasant fashion somehow. So the prime number theorem is equivalent to the statement that the, um, well, basically that the average value of the von function is basically x. So what should we expect? to happen if we sum over not all x, but just those x's that are congruent to c mod d, for some d. Well, the primes modulo d, let's say modulo 6, so the primes are usually not congruent to 0 um, mod 6. Otherwise, they'd be divisible by 6, but they're also usually not congruent to 3 mod 6, or they'll be divisible by 3. And actually, mod 6, the only things that a prime could be congruent to are, are actually 1 and 5. And um, there's no real reason that prime should favour being 1 mod 5 over 4 mod, uh, over 5, sorry, 1 mod 6 over 5 mod 6. So one expects them to be equally distributed in those two vertical classes. So if you take all the primes less than x, what one expects is that they're equally distributed, equal distributed, amongst the residue classes co-prime to d. And if that were so, then you'd expect that statement to be true. Um, number of primes less than x and congruent to c mod d is roughly x over 5 d. <coughs> number of residue classes uh, mod d that are co-prime to d. So that's what we expect to be true. So this is expected to be true uh, very widely. And by that I mean it's expected to be true for really quite large values of D. <coughs> so the most um, D less than or equal to X, and then for all values of C um, mod D. Well, providing <coughs> that the highest common factor of C and D is 1. So I should say that here. So as 
as often with prime numbers, what we, ex what we expect to be true and what is true, um, or what is known to be true, are miles and miles apart. Um, so this is only known. for quite small values of d. So it's actually only known for d less than basically a, powers of, a fixed power of log x. So that's quite small. And it's actually likely to be quite hard because essentially the generalized Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to knowing this for d less than about the square root of x. Um, it's expected that this is true even for d up to x to the power of 0.99 or something. Uh, but that goes beyond even the generalized ring hypothesis. So it's, one shouldn't expect statements like this to be proven anytime soon. But remarkably, there's this work of Bombieri and Vinogradov from the 1960s. Uh, which is almost as good as this, at least if you're happy to have a result that's true only for almost all values of d. Um, so, by the way, I should, I should introduce, instead of saying this, let me give a name to this property, so definition. Um, we say that the primes are nicely distributed in one d. expected formula that I wrote up there and I'm being a bit vague about the exact meaning of approximately equals so x is common to c mod d so if that holds for all values of c mod d distributed not for all d less than the square root of x, but for most d less than the square root of x. So the primes are nicely distributed for most d. Any experts in the audience, there are all sorts of things that are somewhat wrong with what I'm saying. I actually need this to be just a bit less than x to the one half by log, and of course I haven't said what nicely distributed means, but let's not, let's not dwell too much on that. So are there any questions on this so far? Everyone seems to be a bit asleep to be honest. <laughs> Right, so I said that there's a link between how primes are distributed in progressions and um, finding bounded gaps between primes. So what these people did, Golson, Pinson, and Yonderen, in 2001, they showed that if you have just a tiny amount more than the bombier even theorem, so if the primes are nicely distributed. And I'm sorry, I do have a question. Yes. Uh, sort of there, there are two mosts on the board now that I think differ. So you said it's expected to be true for most d smaller than x. Yeah. And then you said it's known for most d smaller than x and a half. Yeah. Are those are different mosts, for otherwise yeah. the Riemann hypothesis would roughly follow. <laughs> So can you can you say what most those are? Yeah. So the, the second one, okay. So the second one means most in the sense of um, the proportion of exceptions is basically tends to zero. Okay. And here it would have been better to say, well, just for the sake of argument, d 
less than x to the point nine nine. So it's not going to be true all the way up to d equals x, but it should be true a little bit less than that. So goldson pitts and Hilderum showed that if the primes are nicely distributed for most uh, d less than x to the theta, for some theta greater than one half, um, then there are boundary gaps between the primes. Um, by which I mean, of course, there are boundary gaps between primes. There are two primes that differ by two. I mean, this Jang's theorem holds. So there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by a fixed bound. Now that in fact, the value of h is something like, well, decay is as, it, it grows as um, theta tends towards a half, but not too bad. So in other words, if you have just a tiny bit, an epsilon beyond the bombier even a theorem, you would have this theorem about bounded gaps between primes. show that the primes are nicely distributed for many d less than x to the theta, but with some technical caveats. <coughs> so Bombieri, Fouvery, Friedlander, and Ivaniets in the 1980s. Um, primes are nicely distributed less than x to the four sevenths, in fact, uh, with some technical restrictions. <coughs> um, so the technical restrictions, unfortunately, meant that what they did did not match up with what goals and principles <coughs> needed to prove gaps between the primes. So what are the technical restrictions? Well, there are basically two of them. Um, the first one is that they could only deal with what are called smooth values of D. And that means that D has only small prime factors. So D has no large prime factors. And then secondly, and much more importantly, they could only deal with C being fixed. So think of e.g. c equals 7 or something. So Bombier, Friedlander, Fubri, and Ivanius could say something about how many primes there are congruent to 7 mod d for most values of d, for most smooth values of d up to x to the 4 sevens. But they couldn't really let c vary with d. So there are two technical issues here. Um, so the first one. The first one is actually sort of removable. And, um, Pitts and Motohashi. And actually, Jack himself, I don't know if he was aware of um, Pitts and, and Motohashi paper. So these two managed to show that if you, you only need to know that the primes are nicely distributed for most smooth D less than x to the theta, and you still get boundary gaps with the prime. So that gets rid of one of the technical restrictions in this Bombieri, Fouvery, Friedlander, and Ivanius. Um, so, but the second one is much more 
and are much more difficult to get rid of. So somehow Zhang's, Zhang's progress is mostly here. So it's somehow removing this restriction that the residue class C um, can't depend on D. But actually, he doesn't completely remove that either. He just allows it to vary in a way that's suitable to match up here. So I'm not going to be able to say very much about, I mean, as you can see, even somehow stating what Zhang did. It's new, it's difficult. And I'm not going to be able to say very much about what goes on inside there at all, but I do want to say a few just sort of general things that you get the sense. So very, very broadly, the idea of these Bombieri, Fubri, Free, Lambda, and Ibanez things, um, well, if, if I get a little bit of time, I'll try and say something, but you basically, they, they use some deep mathematics, so there are two two types of deep mathematics that they use. There's estimates coming from automorphic form theory, about which I understand quite little, I should say. And then there are estimates coming from some serious algebraic geometry, so estimates coming from Deleen's proof of the Riemann hypothesis. So I think that the Bombieri, Fouvry, Freeland, and Ibanez were mostly in the 1980s using this technique. Um, so somehow it seems you have to import some deep machinery to get statements like this, and they were mostly using this deep machinery. Um, Zhang is using entirely this machinery. So some people may have seen what's called a Klosterman sum. So a Klosterman sum is something like the following. So it's the sum over all n modulo p of e to the 2 pi i um, over p times something like uh, a n plus B times the inverse of n mod p. So this is uh, this is one example of where you use some fairly deep algebraic geometry to get an estimate for this, and it was shown by Andre Bay, basically that this is at most two times the square root of p. Which, if you think about it for a bit, you're adding up p things, each of which has unit modulus and points in some direction. So what this is saying is that these cancel, these give square root cancellation, just as though you were throwing down random vectors on the unit circle. So what Zhang uses is um, considerably deeper than this. It's an estimate for certain products of Klosterman sums. Um, and as if that weren't enough, uh, even that was already in the work of Bombieri, Ibanez, Friedlander, and Fouvry. And Zhang's new observation is that in these more complicated estimates than this, if P is not a prime but is composite, you actually beat the square root bound by just a tiny bit more. There's a, somehow a singularity that occurs that lets you get just a tiny bit more out of it. And that tiny bit more is actually the crucial new ingredient that makes everything happen. Without that, you get nothing. Else. So I'll happily discuss a few more details of that with anybody who's interested over coffee. But I think the best thing to do in this talk is to concentrate on trying to explain at least something about how the <coughs> work of Goldson, Pitts, and Yodrim goes. Um, because it's not at all obvious why there should be any link between how primes are distributed in progressions and primes having small gaps. <coughs> 
the statement that the primes are nicely distributed for most d less than x of theta has a name. It's called the elliott halberstam conjecture. Um, the primes are nicely distributed for d. So this is there's one of these conjectures for every value of theta. And what Golson, Pintz, and Yodrin do did is show that Elliot Halberstam theta implies bounded gaps between primes. If you, look for, if you have this for any value of theta bigger than a half. in the rest of the talk is just to explain some of the ideas that go into that. So were there any questions on this before I started raising things, which I'm of course things to do now. I'm unsure about the quantification of x. So primes are nicely distributed mod d, that's with respect to a particular x, right? Hang on, just, let me just concentrate oh. on the board. Sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's very big. Um, right. We care about how primes are distributed mod d. Um, and the, the larger we're allowed to take d, somehow the more information we have about how primes are distributed in progressions. And the game is to make d as big as you can in terms of x. So think of x as just some very big parameter. Um, I'm asking a more simple question now. Um, the definition of um, there, we say that primes are nicely distributed mod d. That's yeah with respect to a particular x, right? It's not, it's not an absolute statement about d. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Right. Um, so I, I suppose I should have, I could have, I could have come up with some definition like the primes are nicely distributed mod d at level x or something yeah, like that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I guess I'm just tacitly thinking of x as some very big parameter that's not sort of fixed. <coughs> okay, so let me try and explain something about this implication. Um, well, actually, what goals and pins in the order improve is something a bit stronger. So let me introduce the notion of an admissible topic. So we say, uh, let h1 up to hk be a k tuple of integers. So we say that this is admissible. So it's admissible if there's a chance, and of course I'm going to make this a bit more precise, there's a chance that all of n plus h1 up to n plus hk are all prime. So there's a chance that n plus h1 up to n plus hk are all prime for infinitely many n. Um, let me illustrate with a couple of examples which will hopefully make this clear. So if you take h1, h2, and h3 to be 0, 2, and 4, then that's not a permissible tuple. And that's because at least one of n, n plus 2, and n plus 4 will be divisible by 3. 
Um, but, and if I take H1, H2, H3 to be 0, 2, and 6, this is admissible. And that's because there's no obvious reason why you can't have n plus n, n plus 2, and n plus 6 all being prime at once. Now, of course, we have no hope of proving that. In fact, that would obviously apply to a prime conjecture if that's true for infinitely many n. Um, So what I really mean here is that there's no kind of, there's no mod 3 or mod 5 obstruction to having all of these numbers prime. So the technical definition is um, that for every p, h1 up to hk um, modulo p misses out <coughs> at least one residue. If that's so, then we know of no reason why um, we couldn't have n plus h1 up to n plus hk all being prime. And it's conjectured, even with an asymptotic formula, that that is the case. But there seems to be no hope of proving that. So what Golson, Pinson, and Yildirim did, in fact, was show that if we assume the elliott halberstam conjecture for some theta than a half, then, and then I take any admissible k tuple, and um, let me assume that k is big enough in terms of theta. Then amongst the numbers n plus h1 up to n plus hk, there are at least two primes. Then for infinitely many n, um, n plus h1 up to n plus hk, so two of, two of n plus h1 up to n plus hk are primes. So that implies that there are infinitely many bounded gaps between primes because, well, there are arbitrarily large admissible tuples. That's, I'll leave that as an exercise. You could just take all of the primes between m and 2m um, for some large value of m, that will always be admissible. So this is a, a strictly more general statement, more precise statement. Intuition. Well, it's not really an intuition, it's a fact of life or philosophy or whatever <coughs> you want to call it. That's been painfully learned by analytic number theorists for the last hundred years, which is it's very hard to say anything about primes, but it's often relatively easy to say something about almost primes. And the basic idea is that almost primes are easier to deal with. I mean, an almost prime means something with just a few small prime factors. I won't say what it means exactly. Uh, but a famous example of this would be Chen's theorem. Um, 
1966 proved that there are infinitely many primes P such that P plus 2 has just has either one or two prime factors. So that's a very strong type of formation. So often if you write down some statements about almost primes, numbers with 10 prime factors, let's say, uh, it's easier to prove that statement, much easier to prove that statement than it is for the primes themselves. So what Gold and Pinter and Yogren do is come up with the idea, let's compute um, the expected number of n plus h1 up to n plus hk that are prime. Uh, given that the product of all of them is an almost prime. So that means something, there's a precise meaning to that which I'll write. So more precisely, um, they want to compute the following ratio, the sum over n less than or equal to x of lambda n plus h1 uh, plus up to lambda n plus hk times mu of n divided <coughs> by the sum over n less than to x of mu of n. When mu is the characteristic function of so mu is the characteristic function of n's um, such that the product n plus h1 times up to n plus hk is almost prime. Now there's almost too many things that I've been vague about here for this evening to quite make sense. Let me just tell you what I mean by almost prime. Almost prime turns out to mean, uh, although this is not obvious until you've actually gone through the calculations, it means k plus square root k prime factors in this case. Well, actually, I don't want to say that now, because that's completely, that, that's very misleading, because if you know that this has at most k plus root k prime factors, then in fact many of them are prime just by the pigeonhole principle. So let me just, let me just leave it at that for the moment. Anyway, they want to compute a ratio like this. And if you could show that this ratio is bigger than log x, then you, you win. Um, so then two of the two of the numbers n plus h1 up to n plus hk would have to be prime. Any questions on this? So let me just write down. We want to show, and so it would be great to show that this is strictly bigger than um, log x. So if we manage that, then because all of these von Mongol functions are bounded by basically log x, um, two of them would have to be. 
That's the idea. And that, but to carry that idea out, you have to be able to compute the numerator and the denominator here, or else the ratio. Uh, I don't know how to compute the ratio without first computing the numerator and denominator. So let's call that star. So we need to compute the numerator and the denominator of star. And this is where we come to what I think is a really brilliant idea. This is Selbert's idea from the 1940s. Um, so I, I said that it's it's relatively easy to do things with almost primes. Um, and that's true in a sense. But Selberg managed to write down some functions new that are not exactly the characteristic function of almost primes. But they sort of morally are that. And they're much, much easier to compute with. So let me tell you what Selberg's functions are. So let's, uh, Selberg just wrote down, let's, okay, so got, let's fix the value of D uh, between 1 and X. So then what Selberg, and it's going to be much smaller than X. So Selberg considers mu of N is the following quantity. The sum over D divides N, and D is less than or equal to 50 of lambda D squared, where the lambda d is just any weight and uh, lambda 1 to 1. So just any function like this. I haven't said anything about what the lambda d are at the moment. So the thing to note about this is that first of all, this is obviously neg non-negative. And then if n happens to be a prime, and provided it's not smaller than d, then mu of n is actually 1. That's pretty obvious, because I'm summing over all divisors of n, uh, this lambda d. And if n is a prime, it only has two divisors, namely 1 in itself. And of those two divisors, only one is in the range less than d. So really, I just pick up lambda 1 squared, which is 1. So any function like this will be a major of the primes. So basically, just ignore this. Ignore the fact that n has to be bigger than d. So this is a major of sort of sits above the characteristic function of the prime. Now, well, that's not saying too much, because the, the constant function 1 sits above the primes, um, but would be pretty useless for saying anything non-trivial about the prime. But the amazing thing is that by judici judicious choice of the lambda d, so by choosing uh, the lambda d judiciously, we can actually make this not too much bigger than the primes. So you can make the total weight of lambda m, let's say less than twice the total weight of the primes. 
So I actually want to show you how you compute this quantity on the left, very roughly, because it's, this is somehow the point that explains how the distribution of primes and progressions is low. And I mean, this also explains why these functions are somehow a little bit easier to deal with than primes. So let's just compute sum n less than equal to x, mu of n, and sum n less than equal to x of sum d divides n, d less than equal to d, lambda d squared. And then we do what analytic number theorists love to do best, well, one of the things they love to do best, other than write logs. Um, is ch interchange the order of summation. Which, by the way, corresponds also to what combinatorialists love doing best. One of the things they love doing, which is double counting things. So we're basically just counting a certain quantity in a different way. So it's the sum over d1, d, and d prime, less than or equal to d, of lambda d, uh, lambda d prime, and then the sum over n less than or equal to x of 1, but now n is constrained, it has to be divisible by both d and d prime. And that means that the lowest common multiple of d and d prime divides n. So somehow this expression on the inside here is the absolutely key thing to note. As long as d and d prime are not too big. So let's, how big should, so roughly, Um, the lowest common multiple of d and d prime is about d squared. So how many numbers less than x are there that are divisible by that lowest common multiple? Well, it's roughly x over that. I mean, you know, the, the number of things less than x that are divisible by 7 is roughly x over 7. But that approximation will break down if I try and make d and d prime too big. So if the lowest common multiple of d and d prime is bigger than x, well, that should be 0, which is useless. Um, so this approximation is only good um, if d and d prime is small. So if d squared is less than x, then the inner sum is roughly x d prime, and then the whole expression just becomes a quadratic form. Um, so sum n less than to x, mu of n is roughly x times the sum over d and d prime, lambda d, lambda d prime, over those common multiple of d and d prime. And we can just evaluate that. Um, or certainly we can choose the lambda d that minimizes that and evaluate it. So somehow this is an easy problem relative to anything to do with primes. So finally, I can, it, I can get to the point of what, how primes are distributed in progressions impacts on this. Because remember, this was just the numerator. This was just the denominator back here. But we also need to compute the numerator. And if you try to compute the numerator, then Well, you end up having to put some extra von Mongol functions in here, lambda of n plus h. And those come all the way through to here. And then instead of needing to estimate the number of things less than x that are divisible by the lowest common multiple of d and d prime, you need to basically estimate the number of primes um, less than x, for which n is congruent to, I guess, minus h mod d d prime. So this is, um, can be controlled if the primes are nicely distributed mod d. Well, not mod d, but mod um, the lowest common multiple of d d prime. 
So that's somehow how knowing how the primes are distributed modulo various d, um, in this case, d d prime, allows you to calculate uh, this numerator over here. So just before I finish, there are two final things I want to say about this. So first of all, I mean this function mu that I introduced was not really the function that you knew. This was supposed to be this mu was an approximation to the primes. I actually need an approximation to this weirder thing about n plus h1 times up to n plus h k being almost prime. But you can do that in a quite similar way. And then finally. Well, once you've done that, you then do actually need to calculate this expression. Um, so you first of all have to choose some optimal weights, and then you calculate this expression using the best information about how primes are distributed in progressions that you have um, at your disposal. And I'll tell you the answer of doing that. I actually don't know how to motivate this answer. Um, I think it's just one of these things that you have to do. You just do the calculation, it's not very easy, and you come out with this answer, 2 theta over 1 plus 1 over root k squared, times log x. Remember, we wanted this to be strictly bigger than log x, so that we could get 2 primes. So there's no chance of doing that if theta, um, so theta is, remember we understand how primes are distributed by d up to x to the theta, this Elliot Halberstam conjecture. If theta is less than or equal to a half, this is useless, because this is forced to be less than 1. Uh, but if theta is just a tiny bit bigger than a half, then by making k very, very huge, you can actually make this strictly bigger than 1. And that's where the um, that's where victory may be declared on the problem. OK, so I think that's about as much as I can reasonably say about this. Um, and that's it. You said that a set is admissible if there's a chance that infinitely many translates of it land entirely within the primes. Yep. And did you say it's a conjecture that if it's admissible, then infinitely many translates of it do land within the primes? Yeah. And is that thought to be significantly hard from the twin prime conjecture? Um, who knows, but it's certainly at least as hard as it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, given that nobody has a realistic way to attach a twin prime conjecture, I'm not sure it's meaningful to say, yeah. who, who knows? Well, actually, I mean, actually, on that point, so maybe, I, so Zhang finds pairs of primes <coughs> that differ by at most 70 million. Nobody can find triples of primes that differ by at, at most a constant. Uh -huh. So I suppose there is, in that sense, um, that the problem of triples is harder. But it may be that all of this is completely irrelevant for proving the twin prime conjecture. That's my theory. Um, so the theorem that, that you now have is that, that you can estimate the, the gap. Can you, is it known whether you can fix a gap? I mean, the twin prime conjecture says there are, there are infinitely many prime pairs that are exactly two apart. Can you yeah, say there not, is an That's not known. No. Okay. And it's sort of... Now I can ask the question, is it infinitely harder? Or is it a lot harder? Is there sort of I'm sure. I mean, that's going to be as hard as, I would think as hard as a twin prime okay. conjecture. What, say, to prove that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by 10 or something? Yeah, or 75 billion. That, that's hopeless. Okay. Yeah. Can you say what it is about, um, about Zhang's proof that lent itself to this rapid lowering of the bound? That's an interesting point. So there are, um, this polymath project is, has been lowering the bound. Um, so one place where spectacular, apparently spectacular gains, although they're not really spectacular to the expert in the subject somehow, um, is this relation that the, the gap is behaving like theta minus one half to the power minus three halves. So Zhang gets some um, Zhang gets theta equals one half plus one over one one six eight. Right? So all you have to do is you improve that 1168 to sort of 1 over 200, which is still only a tiny bit past theta equals a half. Then you've got yourself, um, I don't know, something like 
6 to the power 3 halves improvement. So there's a factor of 10 for you straight away. And then the other thing, you can really optimize this goals and Pinkston, Pinkston yield and sitting argument in various ways as well. So that, that has also led to some big advances. But there are some serious natural obstacles to how far you can hope to go. I, I guarantee you, you're not going to go as far as 1,000, although it's risky to say these things. <laughs> um, my personal feeling is that 10,000 is sort of the ballpark area that this, is, this will end up. Um, there are many, many, many obstacles um, in the way of getting beyond that, and then some of them are just insurmountable given anything. We'd have to have like completely new ideas on things. So where does the exponent 3 over 2 come from? Well, it comes from basically more or less choosing the optimal choice of lambda d. If you phrase it properly, it ends up as a calculus of variation of the problem, the solution of which is given by a certain Bessel function. And it comes from the asymptotics of the zeros of that Bessel function. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, let's thank Ben again.